Hello, and welcome to Quadriga, DW's international talk show coming to you from the heart of the German capital, Berlin. I'm Brian Thomas, and today we're all going to explore how journalists around the world failed to grasp Donald Trump's pull for so many voters. The New York Times labeled him a lunatic, and many other journalists quickly followed suit. The man with no chance, as he was called, is now President-elect Trump. He's preparing to take power. Few in the media saw it coming. The question is, why not? It's being called the biggest failure in modern American journalism. I'd like to start out by thanking our guests today for being here to help us figure out how our profession went so very wrong, and hopefully to come up today with a few solutions to regain at least some trust from those who've lost faith in the media. Our guest today, Matthew Karnischnig, he's the chief editor for Europe, for Politico. He's based here in Berlin. He says it is a myth that good journalism failed. The Trump phenomenon was well explored and analyzed, but the ruling classes ignored the warning signs. Many people, especially elites, are in denial over the anti-globalization wave sweeping the West. Alan Posner is a political commentator for Die Welt. He says Trump and the populists have a simple trick, unleash anger and hatred. Serious journalists have a simple answer, stick with the facts. They win in the end. And Ursula Weidenfeld is a business journalist. She's worked for top German publications, including the Financial Times, Handelsblatt. She says, the US election shows not only the crisis of Western democracy, it's also shown that journalists have lost control over the news business. I'd like to welcome all of you to the show. Ursula, if we could start with you, is it that bad? Have we, has the traditional media, have we lost control of the news business? Well, at least we are beginning to lose control and the past elections are, are some, have some signs for that. And that is um, that um, our social media was much more important, obviously much more important for people to make up their mind um, on the, the two candidates uh, that um, people in the, uh, on the countryside thought that, that there is no place for them in, in the media, in the West Coast and East Coast media. And probably that um, journalists took Donald Trump a long time as entertainment and, and not as serious as they should have taken him. As seriously as considering how he was connecting in the countryside with the people you mentioned who were ignored, basically. Uh, Matthew, I'd like to get to you. Your organization, Politico, you published the Gallup poll back in September that showed a full 70% of Americans had lost much or some trust in the media. Didn't that set off alarm bells? Didn't that get you guys over Politico thinking, we need to get out there, we need to figure out what's happening with the 70%? Well, I think people are out there, to be honest. I think that it's a myth that the media failed here because there are reporters all over the country. It's a huge country, first of all. I mean, we're not talking about Luxembourg here. We're talking about a country that is several thousand kilometers wide. There are 320 million mm -hmm. people. And in the end, it was pretty close. I think that now people are looking back and there's all of this self-flagellation in the press saying, oh, how did we get it wrong? Much deserved, well, maybe. <laughs> well, but Hillary Clinton actually won a, uh, not a full majority, but she beat Donald Trump in terms of the popular vote. So the national polls weren't that wrong. The polls in the individual states were wrong, but journalists aren't pollsters. You know, we need something to guide us through this process. We're not, uh, you know, scientists. We, we look at the polls, we look at everything else that's going on, but I don't think we were, we were even making predictions. And if you, if you really look at the trajectory of what happened over the campaign, there were lots of ups and downs. Uh, just a couple of weeks before, or even just a week before the election, you had this issue with the FBI investigation. Emails, there was a okay. lot of reporting about that, about what it would mean for Hillary if she could still win. So I, I don't really understand why now there's, oh, we, we, we all got it wrong. I don't think people got it wrong at all. But maybe the reporters aren't where they need to be out in the countryside, as, as Ursula was indicating. Maybe they're at the press conferences. They're at the demonstrations. They're not getting out talking to, for example, the Trump supporters. Alan, I'd like to move on to you now. Um, we'll pick up that as well later on. Uh, just before we went to air, we heard 
Uh, the French leadership saying that it is possible that the Front National's Marine Le Pen, the far-right Marine Le Pen, could possibly win the elections in France, so the Trump phenomenon coming to the continent. Um, has the German press grasped the scope of the Trump phenomenon? Well, how can the German press grasp the, the scope of the phenomenon when we don't even know what the scope is? I mean, is Trump going to upend the liberal world order? Is he the peacemaker with IE, as the economist put it, who's going to, you know, who's going to end free trade, reintroduce protectionism, do away with NATO, help people like Marine Le Pen rise to power, which will destroy the European Union? Is it going to be that? In which case, you know, I'm, I'm, I'll be on the right side of history because I've written that, but I do understand that there are colleagues of mine who are saying, no, you know, it's, it's, he's going to be contained. The American institutions are still very strong. And the point is we're all, we're all pretending as if the press, the media, were this block. And by doing so, I mean, if we do so, we are parroting Trump's and Le Pen's propaganda. It's not the, f the fact that within my own newspaper, Die Welt, there are very different opinions about what this means. And, and so obviously, has, has the, the press, have the media understood what Trump is about? Did no, Welt, did like Welt, everyone else, we're, we're scrabbling about trying okay, to find... Did, did the Welt go out and talk to Trump supporters? That is a big question right now. Were people reporting on the Trump supporters? Were they out in the countryside? Were they looking at what was happening? Ursula indicated that. That's the big criticism in America right now. Journalists fell down in doing what they really do best, boots on the ground, getting out and talking to people. Did Develt do that? We had a whole lot of people out there. And I mean, for instance, one of our, it's, you know, it's not just Trump supporters. One of our reporters got arrested in Ferguson, Missouri, talking to sort of, if you will, the other side of the phenomenon, you know, the Black Lives Matter phenomenon. He, got a, he experienced police brutality at first hand. And of course, we had people out in Maryland, it's not all that far from Washington, D.C. Um, and, and, and North Virginia, where where they were all, you know, where the hillbillies were. And not only our people. I mean, you read a book, George Packard. He's a, he, he, a staff writer for The New Yorker. He wrote a book called The Unwinding, about what was happening to, happening to the American uh, middle class. Um, I mean, it's not as if there's this book, Hillbilly Elegy, about the same phenomenon. It's not as if we didn't know it. It's just that none of us thought, or very few of us thought, this would be enough to become president. OK, so we missed that. It's a black swan. It happens. We also didn't know, didn't see the 2008 recession coming, which is actually the reason for all this. We're not prophets. We're journalists. We report on facts as we see them. We don't report we on do what's going to happen. We do important things, though, occasionally. I mean, the weapons of mass destru destruction, this is the biggest thing since then for me. We didn't see that in Iraq. We don't want to focus on that today, but that's something we missed as, as journalists, certainly. Not and, in Germany. Uh, I mean, Alan in Germany, Fisher, no one believed the... The, the, the American press fell down there. OK, let's, let's move on. Let's take a look now. Um, we've been demonized, certainly, by members of the Trump uh, campaign. Let's look at how Donald Trump has demonized... Uh, for his, his part of it, the press, and how that has resonated, that demonization of the press, with tens of millions of Americans. And it's a movement against a lot of things. Our biggest obstacle is the press. They're so dishonest. They are, um, no. False stories, all made up. Lies, lies. With the horrible misrepresentation that's given me by the media, I mean, the New York Times is disgusting. And I'm not just talking about CNN. They're all bad. Honestly, they're all bad. I don't know what it is. Is it like inferiority complex? But the media, which is one of the most dishonest groups of people ever, ever, ever you're ever going to meet. Okay, that's quite a demonization. Um, I don't think it's fair personally, but let's discuss that in the round. And first, I'd like to continue, Matt, with uh, what the Columbia Journalism Review said is that uh, this is the, the greatest failure in a generation, perhaps in all of modern American journalism. Uh, they're calling it the anti-Watergate. What do we need to do to turn that around? 
Look, I, I don't think there is anything that we can do to turn it around. I, 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 again, I just sort of reject this narrative. narrative. And if, if, if you look at that video that we just watched, I mean, who was taking that video? Where, where did people see that? They saw it on CNN. They saw it on Fox. All these mainstream media outlets that he's castigating there. The reality is, is that they made him what he is. He should be thanking them now because those are the people who followed him around the country. I mean, you said before we weren't <laughs> out there with boots on the ground talking to Trump supporters. I'm sorry, but we were. We were at all of these rallies. You had reporters. So we've been used in our own demolition, on. basically. Absolutely. You had reporters <laughs> getting spit on. They became a prop during this campaign where he would say, look over there, you know, look at these losers from the media over there. And you had some pretty ugly things happening at these rallies. And I think that's why a lot of reporters may have thought privately, and they, they wrote this as well, that, well, when the American people see this, they're going to be shocked and they're going to be disgusted and they're not going to vote for him. Well, the, the opposite happened and they, they liked it and they did vote for him. So I don't think that there was somehow you know, a, a lack of information. And, you know, if people are saying that the, the, the press fell down, well, what, what exactly were the consequences of it? I mean, it's not that they were pushing a Hillary narrative, or that's actually what the Trump people are saying, is, is that they were, you know, they, they were pretending that Hillary was going to win. Well, if that's true, uh, it didn't help because she lost. Okay. Right? She, Ursula, what about the economic model um, of, the, of the press in America? How does that fit in with all of this? Well, I think that is one of the crucial points because... Um, Media or the press firstly took Donald Trump simply as entertainment. Mm -hmm. They just thought he will never make it, he will never become Republican candidate, he will never become president. And that is, that's entertainment that brings us clicks and commentaries and that will push our news business. And that was the first big mistake media media made. If I could just say one thing on that, though, just to, just to clarify, that people did say that during the primary, but at the point where, the, you know, he was at the convention and where he got the nomination, I think from that point on, people did take him seriously mm -hmm. because he was underestimated from the very beginning and people did laugh at him. But from that moment at the convention where he was going to be the Republican nominee... Things changed then. Things yeah. changed. Yeah. But then, then they started to feature him and... Not to feature him as a rule breaker, as somebody who lies, but to feature him as um, a candidate. So uh, that was the second mistake: those that nobody started to falsify everything he said at the first, from the first point that media were not quick enough to uh, just uh, falsify all the lies and all the uh, the statements he made. They just thought we mustn't take that seriously because it is Donald Trump. But Trump sells well, isn't that, isn't that part it's, of it? I mean, it, it, yeah. it's the business. That, that's the business case, yeah. of course. Alan, what, what do you think? You know, uh, here in Europe, in, in Germany, what, why did the, the press take in and embrace uh, Trump on one level, the economic level, giving him so very much coverage? It was inevitable, wasn't it? Well, look, um, talking about taking Trump seriously. Most of my colleagues from the very beginning were saying, what an awful guy, how, how terrible. I mean, you know, and my reaction, I have to admit, my reaction was to say, look, it's the primaries, he's a fool. There's a, there are always fools in American primaries. It's entertainment. Yes, I wrote that and I was wrong, okay? But it's an error of judgment that one commentator in one newspaper made and let them be 10 of those who made a similar. Other, others were onto him from the word go, saying that he's a misogynist, he's a racist, he's a this, he's a that. And he is all of those. Uh, plus, he's a lunatic. Yes, he is. The fact is, he was elected. Now, that it can happen. We, the fact is, we trusted American democracy, and I hope we still do. We trusted American democracy. This is what the system is for, to prevent people like that coming into power. This is why I've defended the Electoral College, I've defended the primary system, I've defended um, all the checks and balances which are supposed well, don't to we sift have to, out. Don't we have to be happy with the choice even if we don't like it? No, we don't. Uh, if someone, we have to if it, someone comes we? into the Oval Office and, and appoints an alt-right candidate like Steve Bannon to be his chief counsellor, then I think we don't have to accept it. Then we have to say, OK, it's war, down to the wire. Of course it is. We don't have to accept How's every... It? stupid thing uh, the American electorate does, and we don't have to accept every stupid thing Mr. Trump does. I think we need to take a stand here. Well, German the, politicians are going to have to work with them. Well, they work with all sorts of people. Mm -hmm. America is still our most important ally, right? And it's going to, hopefully, going to stay that way. It's not in our power to stop him. But, but you know, we, we, we don't have to now somehow become op opportunists and, and look for silver linings all over the place. I don't think we have to do that. And so if he says against, you know, 
if he says that his chief enemy is the press, I think we should take him seriously and say, you can, you know, if you want a war, you can have it. Well, he's not only going to have a war with traditional media, there's also vlogs, blogs, a lot of alternative media out there that are very concerned with press freedom. And um, I like to talk about that right now. Is, is there more competition coming up from this that, that you've noticed, Matthew, the vlogs, the blogs? Have some readers been going over there? Is that where they're clicking? The alternative media? Well, I think that they're definitely clicking there. They're not leaving mainstream media completely. But if you look at the, the, the run-up to the election, it was uh, quite interesting that uh, sites like Drudge, uh, Breitbart, had enormous growth in their traffic. Drudge being, you know, a particularly uh, right-wing site, mm -hmm. had something like 1.5 billion page views per month which is extraordinary. I mean, this is an operation Compared to, with, can I ask how many Politico gets in a month? I, I don't even know, to be honest. Okay. I, I don't want to hide it. I'm not sure right. it's, it's available on the internet, but it's, it's, that, that is a huge number. It's not 1.5 billion, I can, I can tell you, you that. You have to say uh, Drudge is different uh, than Politico. It's a news aggregator. There's a lot of it's different links on there. You guys write your own pushes, stuff. It yeah. pushes this narrative, this you know, alt-right narrative, as people are calling it now. And uh, Carl Bernstein of uh, Woodward and Bernstein uh, fame said that before the before the election, a couple of days before the election, said if if Trump wins, it will be in large part because this alt right media like Drudge pushed him for so long and reached so many people and really played the same role that Fox News had played in the past for for, for other Republicans. So this alternative media, this this social media out there, is uh, you know social media and and these these alt right news sites rather have become a, a very powerful uh, force. And yet people are still reading traditional media. And uh, you know, we were talking about before the show, it's really interesting that Trump, just a couple of days after he won the election, he's back on Twitter and what is he tweeting about? He's complaining about the New York Times. You know, so he still cares about yeah, it. Yeah, you know. I, I mean, we're not going to go away. Well, we, and, right? we have a lot of resources, <laughs> and, and, you know, we're very uh, serious about our profession. So um, the German press is, of course, also doing some soul-searching, as Alan indicated right now, after also getting the Trump phenomenon wrong. I want to look at some of the headlines. I want to also say um, that there's a lot going on in Germany in this regard. Let's have a look. Oh my God was the front page headline of the weekly Die Zeit. The tabloid Bild wrote, we'll survive him as well. The Berliner Zeitung posed the question, why Trump? Why not Hillary Clinton? And the Tagesspiegel asked, should we be afraid? Alan, let's pick it up with you. Trump supporters would look at that and say there's an inherent liberal bias in the German media. Um, they're probably right up to a point. There's also an inherent anti-American bias in German media. Um, Trump confirms the worst fears of the people I've spent most of my journalistic life um, combating, people who think that America is you know, close to fascism and could tip in that way all the time, people who think that Europe should disconnect from America and, 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 and move closer to Putin and all sorts, uh, and that kind of stuff. Um, you know, people who are against capitalism, people who point to the, against globalism and so on. So, and have seen hitherto America as the leader of capitalism, globalization, and a liberal model of democracy. Yes, all that comes out in some of these uh, 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 some of these newspaper headlines. And the trouble is, the point is for, for news media in Germany, you're fighting on two fronts. On the one hand, you have to say Trump is not what we consider a true representative of what America is about. At the same time, we have to fight. You know, those people are going to exploit the Trump presidency mm. to move Germany away from America. It's a, it's, it's a difficult position to be in, a rock and a hard place. Okay, well, Matt, you were following what's happening both the German and, and the America media. Did, did you see a big difference? Well, I think the German media tends to follow the American media on issues like this. I mean, I, I, I agree with Alan. I think part of the problem, though, is that the German media you know, Spiegel, Süddeutsche, uh, FAZ to a degree, they tend to take their lead from the New York Times, mm. maybe. And, and so that's sort of driving, driving the, the story here. Record, and right. it's also kind of, you know, their, their hopes in the back of their mind over, over who should win. That said, I, I, I think it's really worth remembering that there was some amazing reporting uh, during this campaign. Uh, the reporters in the United States broke stories uh, about Trump's taxes, for example. They broke the story about uh, Hillary's email. That 
that wasn't Drudge. It wasn't Breitbart. Those were uh, the mainstream. The FBI did help with the emails. I mean, yeah, but the, the story was still broken be by but before before the FBI. I think got on the trail. The story came out initially uh, in 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 the American press. So there was a lot of investigative reporting going on there. And if you look at if you ask yourself, well, what is really the role of the press in an election like this? It's to hold these people accountable. It's to really explore who they are, mm -hmm. what their records are. It's not so much to predict who's going to win. Now, all of those facts were out there, and the American public decided to vote for him anyway. And I think, you know, that is really the story that people missed, if anything, is that at the end of the day, they didn't care. And, you know, people, you know, there are always these accusations of liberal bias. I mean, if, if, if uh, the, the Washington Post or the Wall Street Journal or whoever reports on the video that, uh, that was uncovered of Trump making these comments about women and they report it, does that mean that they have a liberal bias? They're just reporting what's going on in the campaign. And these are all relevant things that people, you would think people uh, should know. Ultimately, they didn't care. Okay, well, like I say, many people here in Germany, you could say, also don't care in a way. They've, they've lost faith in the, in the traditional media. The accusations include misinformation, bowing to state control, censorship. According to one survey, Infratest Demap, 42% of Germans doubt the reliability of their country's media. These demonstrators called liars. The mainstream media no longer seem to be reaching many people here. The far-right Pegida movement is one example of that. Its protest target not only the government's immigration policies, but also the media. Why is there such a disconnect? Ursula, why do you, why do you think there's such a disconnect? Well, I think media are considered in Germany, as in the US, as part of the establishment, as um, um, press which um, only transports and commands on things. The government wants to be transported, wants to have transported and to be co-commanded. Um, and that uh, people on the countryside are not considered as part of the society, as part of the public discussion, as, uh, as not seen with their needs or with their opinions. And, and that is um, the biggest challenge media has to cope with in, in the next, in the upcoming years, especially because even in Germany, we do have a far-right politician mm -hmm. uh, party, and, and, and they probably will be successful in the next election. So how to cope with that, how to uh, discuss these issues is uh, crucial even for, for German press and for, for German media. Well, coping with that is going to become much more difficult in January. That's when Breitbart arrives in Berlin. It's coming to Germany, a German version of Breitbart. Um, does that have you worried, Alan? Do you see competition there? Of course, yeah, of course. And, and what Ursula said yeah, about social media. The point is, you have to have a lot of money in order to, to have reporters, journalists working on things, actually reading reports, talking to people. And the press is starved, the media is starved for money, unless they're state media like the one we're, place we're sitting in now. Independent media, like the outfit I work for, are starved for money, have to cut back on staff and so on. So it's, we're really... The Spiegel just announced that it was not cutting well, staff. Yeah, we're, for we're the all first cutting, time cutting, in, in you area. know, and, yeah. and, and, and we really have to see how, how we, people are working. My colleagues are working about double what they worked when I joined the paper, honestly. They're doing all the jobs we had layouters for and all sorts of things uh, when, when I started. We're in a really difficult position, but we're still the only people actually doing that because people like Breitbart, Mm -hmm. they, they don't go out and research anything. They just take media reports from Russia Today or from anywhere else, and they put them online in a sort of post-factual melange mm -hmm. uh, of, of, of so-called news, and people read that stuff. But okay. it's, you know... But, but that, yeah, has, but that, that means that, that we, that journalists, have to resist the temptation to only look for clicks and commentaries and the social networks only, are only gaining for just um, um, entertainment, this, and they have to become serious again. This huge amount of readership moving to social media is actually, you could say, under attack right now by the German government, which is criminally investigating Facebook's owner, Mark Zuckerberg. Is that the right way forward, to clamp down on social media? With government investigations, he's being charged with not removing hate speech quickly enough. German ministers are meeting, by the way, today to draw up guidelines that hate speech is removed within one day. Is this the right way forward, that kind of government clampdown? Let's ask Matt as, a, as an American. I, 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 just, I understand the motivation behind it. I doubt that it will work, and I think that this is what the Germans will, will ultimately discover. It's Facebook today, maybe uh, Twitter tomorrow, and then in a couple of years, something else. 
uh, uh, rises up. The reality is is that Facebook isn't allowing this stuff because it likes it. It's just it's very difficult to police when you have as many users as they do uh, to take this stuff down in in a, in, a, in a timely fashion or at all can can be can be quite challenging. So I, I think this is unfortunately the nature of this online sphere in in, in which we live. Twitter today uh, or, or or yesterday announced uh, you know more. Uh, strong controls on this on this type of thing and they actually shut down the the account of one uh, particularly particularly uh, blatant racist uh, uh, preacher on there but you know the the reality is is that there's still a lot of very offensive language in these in, in these social media maybe uh, we'll pick up sites. that issue with our next show how to deal with that on social media we've run out of time and we'd like to hear your ideas about what we as members of the press can do better to get the story right. For now, let me thank our guests for today, Alan, Ursula, and Matthew. Thank you so very much for being with us. And thank you for joining us here at Quadriga as well. Remember, get in touch with us exactly about this issue. What can we do better? Thanks for joining us.